Good afternoon, everyone. And um, I'm Michele Tomea from the Italian Chamber of Commerce. Uh, this afternoon, as you saw, we have a specific technical presentation about 3D printers from uh, Formlab uh, dedicated to the changing automotive and manufacturing industry. Uh, this afternoon with us, uh, we will have uh, uh, Ms. Seiko Nishino, APAC uh, application engineer for Formlab. Uh, she will uh, deliver soon a presentation uh, about uh, uh, this technical device uh, and application. Uh, automotive will be the main topic, but also we will see uh, during the presentation um, also how we can use uh, uh, this 3D printer uh, uh, machine in other fields like uh, medical, uh, jewelry application, and several others. Uh, if you have any technical question uh, during the presentation, you can drop it in the chat with my team and the team of Formlab from Singapore. Uh, we will uh, collect the question. In the meantime, Mr. Lee Marriott uh, will reply to um, in the chat. And uh, at the same time, if you have some complex uh, uh, inquiries, we can uh, bring it back to a Q&A session later on. Uh, overall, the webinar will last about an hour. Uh, we will have uh, probably 30 to 40 minutes presentation with several interesting slides and video. And uh, thank you for joining to, to this afternoon. We have several participants, so I will ask uh, just a few more minutes uh, of your patience uh, before we start officially. And uh, after the, the event, uh, we will upload the record of uh, this webinar on uh, the TICC YouTube channel that I just had in the chat uh, right now. Uh, in uh, the YouTube channel of the TICC, the Italian Chamber of Commerce, we'll find several other webinars uh, for several industries. So we are talking about uh, business opportunities in Thailand uh, as well as in uh, Italy. Uh, we are located in Bangkok, so today we are connected from uh, actually Bangkok downtown and from the part of the team uh, uh, of the Forum Lab from Singapore as well. So, okay, with no much further ado, I will uh, officially um, start. Uh, just a few words about uh, the background information that uh, could be interesting to know. Uh, Ms. Seiko Nishino is our speaker today from uh, Formlab. Um, she is an application engineer, works to introduce uh, 3D printers to workflow and explore new uses of 3D printers machine. Seiko has worked on CA specializing in kit transfer stimulation in her previous job, and her background is in mechanical engineer, where she conducted researches on 3D printing of medical implants, and since then have been working with 3D printers. Formlab is a company that is uh, um, at the quarter in Boston. Uh, they have uh, several, uh, um, several branches in Asia, of course, Bangkok in Thailand and uh, China and Singapore. Uh, today, the team will be available uh, uh, online to reply your uh, question and inquiries in the chat. If you have anything that is uh, uh, more technical, we can uh, uh, start uh, uh, and bring it back in the Q&A session later on. But in the meantime, I would like to invite uh, Ms. Uh, Nishino to deliver her presentation. So thank you, everyone. And uh, thank you. All right. Thank you for the introduction. Um, I am Seiko. I'll be conducting this session. Thank you, everyone, for joining in today's session. It is called Road to Car, Four Ways How 3D Printing is Changing the Automotive Industry. As uh, he, uh, uh, there was a kind of introduction. My name is Seiko. I'm an applications engineer here at Promabs. Right. So hopefully you can see my screen. Before I begin, just a little bit of housekeeping items. Uh, feel free to add in, uh, ask any questions at the chat option. I believe there is an, a Q and A uh, option at the bottom. Uh, we'll be, we'll love to hear any questions you have, and I'll try to answer as many questions as we can at the end of the session. Also, my teammate will be answering any questions uh, simultaneously while I'm presenting. So let's just begin. In today's session, I'll quickly introduce 
platform labs just in case uh, you do not know us and then jump straight into today's topic four ways uh, how 3D printing is changing the automotive industry. The first way being in prototyping, then in creating final end parts, then in producing tooling and manufacturing aids, and finally to address the spare part problem in the automotive industry, which is pretty much applicable to other industries as well. So with that, let's begin. Starting off with who is Formlabs? We are Formlabs. We create reliable, accessible 3D printing systems for professionals. Our mission is to expand access to digital fabrication so that anyone can make anything. Our printers are really, really straightforward to use and really easy to use. And we try to really maintain it as affordable as possible as as we can, uh, making sure our printers are not only used in the industry or factories and companies, but also in schools as well. And partially, I was actually using our 3D printer formats, 3D printers back when I was studying. We are not only the manufacturer of 3D printers, but also the materials as well. We currently offer around 25 plus materials really designed to fit the needs of your application. And we have options from general prototyping and engineering, dental, healthcare, jewelry, education, and audiology. And these are really just a couple of industries our printers are used in and how we really, really remain competitive in this a uh, range of industries really come down to the resins that we offer. So let me introduce to you how our resins are contributing to some of the industries. So a good example, people tend to oversee the printers are currently being used in healthcare. So we have a range of uh, materials that are biocompatible. We have for this left hand side, Biomed Clear. Biomed Clear was actually developed for the usage of long term skin and mucosal membranes. So that'll be your eyes and your mouth as well. And we have Biomed Amber, uh, second from the left. This is also biocompatible, and I think this is a usage that is currently quite hot. Uh, it is currently being used to make PCR tests to go inside your nose to actually test for COVID. And these, this is used for uh, this resin is currently being used quite widely uh, in the case of COVID nineteen. So we also have a standard materials. There are also quite heavily used in healthcare to make anatomical models. We have uh, resins that are opaque and hard and also uh, materials that are even transparent and soft. Another industry people tend to miss, uh, dismiss 3D printing for, but it's actually a very much a growing market is jewelry. jewelry. So we have materials that have wax in them that can potentially substitute lost wax. So say goodbye to the days you were actually carving out wax. Uh, right now you can actually 3D print them and uh, cast them directly. If you are considering mass production in jewelry as well, you can also use vulcanized rubber molds, uh, which can be made from 3D printed masters. So we do have materials that is, uh, that is high temperature resistant. So our printers are also very widely used in the dental industry for biocompatible applications as well, such as a surgical guide uh, that you can also autoclave. And they're also used for model creations that are used as a mold to make thermal thermo for appliances in orthodontic models. So hopefully this sort of gives you a good idea of the range of applications. Um, I do realize that we haven't covered anything in engineering and manufacturing, but don't worry. That's what today's webinar is going to be all about. So let's just dive right into today's topic, four ways how 3D printing is cha changing the automotive industry. So number one, so four ways, so this is the first one. Starting off with how 3D printing is reshaping the prototyping industry. So this one's kind of straightforward. I think it's quite intuitive. It is already being implemented, is already reshaping the prototyping process in the automotive and many other industries as well. 3D printing at this stage is quite straightforward, I think, and with any industry that makes anything physical, whether it be automotive or electronics, toy making, uh, 3D printing is already being implemented in the prototyping stage. I do want to say that this may seem intuitive and straightforward, but bear with me, you're right, prototyping is the most easiest and a natural way to introduce 3D printing. What a lot of people miss is that you can combine 3D print with other processes taking prototyping to a next level. So let me show you some examples starting off with Volkswagen. So 
What you see here is the VW Type 20. It's a Volkswagen concept bus to celebrate their 10th anniversary in the research center in California. So this is, as you can see, a variation of the classic VW minibus from the 60s. But what's special about it is that it incorporates a lot of aspects of generative design. And you can actually see on the side mirrors as well as the wheels. These have a pretty unique design. And those wheel hubcaps that you can see, the, uh, the, metal, the metal looking parts, which has the VW iconic styling, had to be fitted uh, very much properly among these organic generative designed uh, spokes. And if you actually look, have a closer look at these hub, hubcaps on the wheels, those beautifully polished chrome silver hubcaps, those are actually 3D printed in Formlabs SLA 3D printers. Now, they're actually printed in a clear resin, uh, just like you can actually see here, these are off the printer, but they were electroplated and has a 0 0.004 inch thick layer of nickel on top. So for those who are not familiar with electroplating or just uh, for those who need a reminder, electroplating is a, an electrochemical process in which metal ions are deposited uh, in a thin layer on top of the surface. So these are actually plastic parts with a thin coating of metal on top. Now the advantage of electroplating 3D printed parts is that you get this beautiful part you can actually see here actually on the spokes you get this beautiful part that was speedily 3D printed in-house with the geometric flexibility and accuracy of 3D printing. But with the advantage of electroplating, it has a really, not really, it has a truly metal surface finish in addition to creating this metal look and also feel if you actually touch it, it does feel like metal, except that it's very, very light. And electroplated surfaces actually significantly strengthen the, the, the plastic parts underneath it and improves material, material resistance to wear, UV exposure and corrosion. So electroplating is ideal for automotive prototyping and in other fields as well, where metallic finishes are crucial, but it also works with, uh, well for production parts that need to have this external characteristics of metal, uh, but be light as possible. So you can actually 3D print something that's hollow or something with a lot of lattice inside and then actually coat it outside. So it looks like a whole chunk of metal when in reality it's actually very, very light. So this is actually a very good example by combining 3D printing and another process like electroplating, uh, or you can actually even cast it out, which we will cover later on. You can wind up with a really beautiful part that are suitable for final prototyping and really for understanding how your product is going to feel for your customers. But I won't be going into too much detail about these processes and how we electroplated it. There are plenty of resources available for that on our website, so do check that out. But let's have a look at another example. So the next example is from Optimus Ride. Optimus Ride is a company based in Boston. Their core product you can actually see on the screen is a self-driving van to enable efficient transportation, as you can see here, right here. Now, they needed large sensor enclosures for their vehicles, uh, which they were actually outsourcing to service bureaus to be printed on an FDM machine. So they didn't have an FDM machine in-house. They were still 3D printing, but they were doing outside. And unfortunately, when they were using these service bureaus, they took a week or even sometimes two weeks to get back and were really, really expensive. Uh, they could have probably cost $100 uh, per part. And I think this is something, it's a common issue, which may be something you guys, uh, may be something you guys are already experiencing. And what Optimus Pride was looking for was a quick turnaround and quick iteration and started using the Form 3L, you can also see on the background, and uh, they brought this in-house. So, you can see Luis, the mechanical engineer at Optimus Ride, holding parts 3D printed, holding parts that were 3D printed, which they used to outsource. And prior to owning a large Form Labs 3D printer, especially when things were time sensitive and she had a really uh, tight project, she would even choose to split parts into smaller individual parts and then print them on a smaller printer, which she did have in-house and combine them together, which was a very, very painful process. So what she was looking for was a large format 3D printer, which she could use in-house. 
Here's an up close shot of the parts that were 3D printed. Louise, the mechanical engineer at Optimus Ride, was really overall pleased with the surface finish of the parts. Uh, the parts she had previously outsourced had really visible layer lines um, on the part, and especially because the parts were the, the intended use of these parts were for cosmetic and aesthetic reasons, it was really important for her that the parts came out really smooth. And she appreciated that Formula's printers really didn't need, uh, didn't have the need to sand it down. So you can see here how 3D printing is great for prototyping, uh, sorry, prototype, prototyping and cosmetic parts as well. And that's quite well known. And people have that, people believe that that's the best and only way 3D printers can be used. But the fact is, it's not the only way. So 3D printed parts are currently being used in testings as well. So let's have a look here with Texas A&M wind tunnels. So they are a large scale subsonic wind tunnel located at Easter, Easterwood Airport CLL in College Station, Texas. So what they do is to provide engineering, uh, engineering and research and commercial testings, also sometimes used in undergraduate education. And projects could include things like bicycles with the riders on top of them, golf clubs, light pole fixtures, airplanes, space re-entry vehicles, and many more. So what they do is really help the customers develop their test plans, design the models, and create the code that helps them collect relevant data. Now. Where 3D printing was used in the wind tunnel is quite interesting. Interestingly, they were already using 3D printers for this application, but they were using an FDM machine, which is again, a 3D printer that is completely different technology from ours. And let me read out a quote uh, said by Lisa Brown, the manager and engineer at the site. I'm gonna read out a quote. We could directly compare the FDM to the Formlabs prints. That was a big eye opener for us is that the big difference in surface quality between the two. So we started there and then we started printing some parts that would repla replace the metal pieces that we had made. And so that was an interesting comparison as well to see how a close printed version could approximate the metal tail surface that we had made here. So this is a really interesting quote uh, for wind tunneling, uh, wind tunnel testing, selecting the right material is, is really, really, really crucial. And the team here at Texas A&M sought out Formlabs Rigid 10K uh, to replace pieces on NASA aircraft model tests. So they had a small printed insert to the leading edge with some sensors inside of it. So the whole model was alu aluminum wing with little bits that were actually 3D printed and replaced by 3D printed parts. So for wind tunnel testing, it is important for the team to have incredible surface quality with a very, very smooth finish. In addition to that, you also have, the parts have to also withstand to deformation, especially because it's going to be tested in the wind tunnel. So they were impressed with this uh, specific resin. They use Rigid 10K, which is our newer resins that we uh, did just launch. And it is a highly glass filled resin. So this is a good example where 3D printing can be helpful, not as something that needs to be pretty in terms of cosmetic and aesthetics, but in actual um, practical usage in testing, use in development and design stage, and potentially to replace metal parts as well. And there are also other practical ways 3D printing can level up your prototyping. So let's have a look at how Ring Brothers make use of their phone labs printers. So Ring Brothers are an award-winning custom car builders. They produce um, a line of high quality, uniquely crafted billet accessories and fiberglass and carbon fiber pieces. And like you would see in many prototyping and product development environments, they use 3D printing to create prototypes of their parts before the machine. And because machining, as you guys may be familiar, is very, very costly. So they wanted to really dial in their design before you take it to the machine and considering you also want to conserve the time you spend on machining so that it can be used for other purposes. And that's what they did here. They introduced Formlabs printers in-house to work on quick iterations so that they can bat out designs on the 3D printer before going on to machining. So 3D printing uh, prototypes increase uh, the cycles of iteration between the digital design and machine part and shorten the distance between idea and final, uh, final successful product. So what 3D printing did is 
it really helped change the team's product development mindset. The team uses 3D printed parts to test the feel, the fit, and the function for a lot of their custom parts, ultimately getting them to the market faster. So here we can see an example of one of the parts they prototyped on our printer. It's the window crank, which I do have uh, one of their iterations on at hand. So these were actually prototyped a couple of times, but not only were they used as a uh, used for checking the shape, but also the fit as well. So these are more functional prototyping. So I just want to clarify here, uh, you don't need to think of 3D printing as something that the user is going to touch. Instead, uh, think of it as a facilitator that makes your engineering process much, much easier. But as they were working with 3D printed prototypes, they realized that the material they were using were a lot tougher than they thought. And that's what leads me to my next point, which is using 3D printed parts for custom complex and final end parts. So continuing with the case study with Ring Brothers, the realization of how um, our materials are quite strong led them to the use of 3D printed parts for parts that live in the vehicle forever. You can actually see the blue part actually much clearer in this slide. The blue 3D printed part here is used as a part of the final mirror assembly. So the mirror, the parts are actually attached as a final permanent fixture to the bond uh, and actually bonded inside a carbon shell with additional parts bolted onto it. So Ring Brothers also had a situation where they had this customer who was looking for uh, a spare part, I would say. So what they did was they needed this Cadillac emblem. This is especially common with older vintage cars, uh, but it's actually much, much cheaper to make these parts rather than trying to acquire existing parts. So Matt Mosen, uh, the product development specialist at Ring Brothers, he describes the challenge here. I'm going to read out another quote. So we found the opportunity to make an emblem that wasn't really suited to the machine out of the out of aluminium. It could have been done, but by the time you chrome that and match it to the rest of the exterior of the vehicle, a lot of detail would have been lost in the emblem. And knowing the customer and knowing the level of what, of what he really wants in the vehicle, we just knew he wouldn't have been happy. So instead of machining out uh, the emblem out of aluminium, what he did was cast uh, the part out of met, uh, cast the part 3D print the part to cast it into metal. Now you can actually see uh, the purple bar part here with the arrow. Uh, you can actually 3D print castable resin, which is called the castable wax, which contains 20% wax. And it really offers high level of detail and surface finish, which is exactly what Matt was talking about and looking to deliver to the customer. And they're able to cast this part in metal. And you can see the results in the photo here as well on the left hand side. So what the message is, is prototyping really isn't just for, sorry, prototype 3D printers are not necessarily just for prototyping, but parts that come out of the printer should be taken into consideration for final parts as well. And as it should also be considered for, my next point, which is in production of tooling and manufacturing aids. So let's check that out. First, starting off with Ford. Ford's body and assembly plant in Valencia, to, they were producing plastic cups used in its engine vacuum tests. So 3D printing was used within all stages of the production process, from design to prototyping to manufacturing and the final end product. And especially what you can see here in the picture, it's actually quite blur, is the plastic caps. And they needed to have the ability to seal tightly around the tool during uh, their motor vacuum tests, but also had to withstand low pressured environment. Now, 3D printing was actually chosen as the best manufacturing method for this specific case, especially because they only required 1,000 caps. So 3D printing is great for small scale production, especially when it doesn't make sense to be investing or uh, investing into a metal mold. 
Let's have a look at another example where 3D printing was used in production of tooling and manufacturing aids. So this is a company called Pankel Racing Systems. They are a manufacturer of drivetrain and aerospace components in the automotive interface industries. And they have a variety of different clients that they serve. And they had a specific client, a well-known vehicle manufacturer approached them and they had a project. They needed to develop, they needed to develop a number of gearboxes. Now to produce each gearbox, it required a set of jigs. They needed to produce over a thousand custom jigs to produce these gearboxes. Now this really isn't an easy task to accomplish, especially when you're in a crunch of time and you have a tight deadline. So they really need to scope out the plan in order to, in order to successfully execute this. And here's kind of the video of what uh, the solution they settled with. You can see here there's a conveyor belt and um, the blue part, which is actually 3D printed, it's part of machining. They're picked up by a machine gripper. It goes off and it's automatically placed onto the next jig. So you can actually see that the blue part, which is actually 3D printed, goes through a lot of heat and stress relief involved. So these jigs were meant to be printed in metal, however, they didn't have the capacity, or not, sorry. These jigs were supposed to be made in metal, but they didn't have the time to be waiting for these parts to be CNC'd or machined or and outsourced, so they ended up actually 3D printing them in plastic. Surprisingly, they were able to withstand these stress reliefs and also withstand to the heat. So when Pankel was deciding on how to approach this problem, they need to kind of create all these uh, objectives based on the volume, but also in terms of speed and also in terms of performance, whether the 3D printed part could withstand this specific uh, course of pr production. Now their solution actually turned out to be quite affordable. So if you were to actually um, outsource this, this would have cost approximately $300, whereas if you actually made this in-house, it would have been $30. So this is actually printed in our resin called Tough Resin, which is one of our engineering resins. This resin is most commonly used in the engineering and manufacturing applications as well, due to the fact that it's very tough. So when people want to have parts that actually go through uh, stress or strain, uh, Tough Resin will probably be a good place to start. Now, Pankel used to outsource these parts, which would have cost them approximately $300, $400 uh, to machine, while printing these parts in-house costs approximately uh, $12. So this is a completely separate jig. Now, if you had machined this from HDPE, it would have cost approximately $220. You can actually see the cost advantage as well. So for this specific project, this required a lot. There were a lot of constraints for, uh, involved in, in regards to speed, the volume, and also in regards to cost. So you can actually see that 3D printing did fit their needs for all, all of the constraints. But not only was there a cost benefit, you can actually see uh, what Christian, the process engineer, who is really overseeing this challenge, uh, who is producing a thousand jigs, had to say. So I'm going to read out another quote. We've had lots of problems in the past because the cooling media, you can actually see the cooling media dropping uh, into the 3D printer part. The cooling media in the lathe is very aggressive to plastic parts and makes them brittle after some time. Parts 3D printed with tough resin have shown resistance against our cooling media and they're strong enough to withstand the intermittent load that these parts have to endure. Holes and length tolerances normally lie within plus minus 0.1 millimeter interval, which satisfies the requirement for our jigs. So for Christian, um, the process engineer at Pankle Racing Systems, it was really about making sure the material matched the gear fabrication so that it could, one, fulfill their timeline to get rid of lead times by not having to outsource, and two, to also make sure that these uh, parts performed for the job or the task that they had they needed to. And this really worked out for Christian and by bringing in an affordable desktop printing, the affordable desktop print in-house, he's able to print 30 different jigs and fixtures on a daily basis. An insight as to how 3D printing 
can also be handy to have in producing and manufacturing aids and clothings, and these could be various different types of custom jigs as well. Now, moving on to the last section, producing spare parts in automotive industry. So there's actually a spare part problem, not necessarily only in automotive industry, but it is quite prominent in the automotive industry. So if you are in a different industry, you can also try to apply it to your specific industries. Producing spare parts in an, any industry historically has been very, very challenging, um, especially spare parts are sporadic and unpredictable in terms of demand. So it's really not so easy to foresee the demand in the future and because of that it doesn't always make financial sense to produce these parts ahead of time on top of that you have to think about the physical storage so it's something you always have to consider and there are some roadblocks there from a financial and a physical sense and to solve the spare parts problem potentially 3d printing could be used um, i think the biggest factor are getting the materials that can match the performance of more traditional materials used for parts and uh, about the cost effectiveness whether it makes sense to be actually producing something with 3d printing now one added advantage is if that if you are going to be 3D printing, the thing is the part are going the parts are going to live forever if you create a digital inventory. So the CAD files, you're able to create copies of the spare parts that you need to and store them online in the cloud and not to have to worry about um, the physical storage. You can also share them uh, universally, universally around the world. So it's much easier when you are, for example, looking at an automotive spare part. Now, we're kind of seeing this transition into a new era where we can uh, start to make everything digital in your workflow and you have these files uh, stored digitally, you should be able to use digital fabrication tools to produce them as needed on demand. So in the future, with the click of a button, when a customer walks into your store and you need a spare part, you should be able to actually print them on demand as needed. And by using an affordable, smaller footprint printer, maybe desktop, maybe benchtop, you'll be able to accomplish that. And you're going to see in the future, suppliers are going to open up dedicated spaces for this. And this is going to be, uh, instead of storing these spare parts, it'll be how much printers will you be having? So this will actually solve some of the challenges that you may have faced before. We have already seen this applied in some of the cases we covered today in the previous section, like the emblem of the ring uh, we had, like the emblem example we had from Ring Brothers a couple of seconds ago. Including the jigs as well from Panko Racing Systems, both are good examples where 3D printing addresses issues, not only with the spare parts, but also with the storage and the ease of replicating uh, with the uses, usage of a digital inventory. So, to summarize, 3D printing is making a change in the automotive industry, starting from prototyping, not only for aesthetic, but for functional, uh, functional working prototypes, by combining it with other processes like electroplating, this can really change the way you prototype. Um, parts, uh, 3D printed parts are not just good for prototyping, but potentially for the final end use parts as well. 3D printing is an ever evolving technology. Materials are constantly being developed and made. So never cross this out, never cross out, oh, a printer shouldn't be used for final end parts and only be used for prototyping. That's not the case. This has slowly been changing. It could be used for final end parts and it also parts like jigs and fixtures and manufacturing aids. Now all of this including final end and even manufacturing aids can be dig digitalized allowing parts to be made as needed and solving the spare part problem. So the cases we have showed today we were all using from labs printers. Uh, we not only offer printers, but for the Form 3 and the Form 3L, both of which are printers which runs on our own technology, but also we produce our materials as well. And before I end this session, let's quickly uncover some materials used in engineering, some of which were used in the cases that we mentioned just a couple of seconds ago. Starting off with the high temp resin. 
So height temp resin on the left hand side has a high heat deflection temperature and what that means is that the material is going to hold its shape at a higher temperature. Now this resin has a heat deflection temperature of 238 degrees celsius at 0.45 megapascals which makes it suitable for a variety of applications, none that we covered today uh, as far as I recall, but it could be very useful in applications such as injection forming, injection forming, injection molding, thermoforming, vacuum forming, and all sorts of molds. It is actually being used in a welding environment as well. We also have a gray pro resin on the right hand side, which has high precision and moderate elongation and resistance to deformation over time, making it a versatile material suitable for a wide range of engineering applications, such as form and fit testing, injection molded product, prototypes, mold masters for plastics, silicones, and more, and Jackson fixtures for manufacturing. We also have our rigid uh, resin, uh, both of which are glass filled. Rigid 10K on the left hand side is a highly glass filled resin. It's the stiffest material in our engineering portfolio. Uh, you can use rigid 10K for precise industrial parts that need to withstand significant loads without bending. Rigid 10K, this resin, exhibits a very, very smooth matte finish and is highly resistant to heat and chemicals. So it's a great uh, for applications like enclosures, jigs, fixtures, turbines, blades, turbines and blades and fluid flow component, which is one of the examples that we covered today with Texas A&M in the wind tunnel. So Bridget 10K was the one that was used in the wind tunnel. And then we have Bridget 4000 on the right hand side is also glass filled uh, resin. It prints with smooth polished finish and, has a, in, and is ideal for stiff and strong parts that can withstand minimal deflection. And uh, you can use Bridget 4000 for again turbines and fans and blades, jigs and fixtures and tools, manifolds, electrical casings and automotive housings. Moving on to the tough and durable family, uh, we have three major resins in this family, two of which were just launched last year. These resins can handle compression, stretching, bending, and impact without breaking, and are great for snap fits and applications like housings, enclosures, jigs and fixtures, connectors, wear and tear prototypes. So this will be the resin that will be capable of withstanding a load or even a fall. This was the resin that was actually used in Panko Racing Systems as a jig. If you remember the blue resin that was on the conveyor belt, um, this resin has actually been now revamped and relaunched as Tough 2000, uh, new and improved. So it's no longer blue, but it is as good. It's called Tough 2000 resin. This resin was also used by Ring Brothers to actually make the window, window crack as well for prototyping. And moving on to the next resin, finally. Uh, this will be a uh, flexible and elastic resin. I don't believe we covered any cases to date, but try to, uh, if you are interested, uh, this will be a soft and flexible resin. The flexible resin on the left hand side, flexible ATA resin, is excellent for simulating soft touch materials and adding ergonomic features to multi-material assemblies like remote controls or grips, and sometimes even in manufacturing of uh, plugs, gaskets, and dampers. While on the right hand side, uh, called Elastic 50A, this is a resin that is suitable for prototyping parts that you would probably make in silicone. It is a silicone like material. It's good for bending, stretching, compressing, and holding. And it's good to hold up uh, repeated cycles without tearing so easily. So with that, that brings me to the end of my session. Let us know how we did by filling in this survey. You can scan this QR code on the screen here to, to fill in this survey. My teammate will also uh, be sending the link in the chat so you can fill in our survey there. If you are interested in Forlas products, you can contact our local uh, reseller in Thailand, Septillion, and request for a sample. And with that, I would like to open up for questions and answers. Thank you a lot. Uh, it was very uh, interesting and extensive presentation on what we can do. And um, uh, we had several, several um, uh, professional connected. So if anyone would like to um, ask directly some question to um, 
Miss Nishino or the team, please, uh, please let us know. And uh, in the chat, there was, uh, there was a question that uh, maybe uh, it was um, um, related to, for example, the type of material that can be used in a 3D printing. Um, someone was asking uh, if it's possible to print steel metal. Yes, uh, I see that question. And does FormLab looks into this option? Uh, for example, for us, that uh, uh, as a chamber of commerce, we are in a, working with general industry. So I mentioned to you that uh, perhaps we work uh, with uh, groups of uh, jewelry manufacturer, uh, automotive sector, medical, and so on and so that. Uh, for example, um, to inject uh, to inject in the 3D printing uh, the resin, the resin or metal, um, does it work like, for example, you need to have a um, plastic master batch or it's the resin like with uh, two components I don't know if you can share it technically or if it's uh, under a certain copyright, uh, but how does it work, for example? Because sometimes we saw um, low quality 3D printers uh, uh, that uh, might cast out your shape, your figure, but then you have to, for example, polish them. Uh, you have to have somebody that work on that. Um, how FormLab can actually uh, be uh, stick out from the mass of the 3D printers? What are the benefits of uh, uh, your uh, machineries? All right, so, okay. So that's a really great question. Uh, to address the first part, whether we are mixing anything in the resins, we usually don't talk about uh, what's exactly inside the resin. Uh, that's not something we talk about, but you're absolutely right. There have been a lot of materials that are mixed in with metal. For example, we do see a certain uh, FDM machines that have metal infused in it, which you have to later bake and then uh, get rid of the plastic. Do we do such things? Um, it's a bit of a yes and no. Yes, we do have certain resins that have uh, special fills. For example, uh, one of the resins that I introduced today, which 10K does have glass inside of it. Uh, whether we have metal, as of now, we do not have metal uh, resins. However, is it possible in the future? Maybe, potentially we could. In regards to the polishing that's required, I think you were referring to a comparison between an FDM and a liquid-based 3D printers. Yes, you're absolutely right. FDM machines are quite interesting in the sense that uh, they do have a mixture of different types of polymers. Sometimes they even have carbon fiber infused in them. But at the end of the day, you do have to sort of sand it down because the layer lines are very, very clear. Uh, where we stand out is really in the quality of our prints. You, we don't have to sand down our parts as long as you don't have anything called support structures on them. And uh, the other benefit of using Formlabs printers is really the materials. So today I covered just a couple of our resins. We actually have 25 and above resins, uh, some of them limited in APAC. However, we continuously develop materials, making it I would say interesting from my point of view because the applications are usually are really really endless. And I'm sorry, did, was there any part of the question that I missed? Uh, there are uh, other participants. Uh, for example, there is another question on uh, referring to the wind tunnel example. How does Formlabs uh, printing method differ from FDM methods? Ah, okay. So that's a really good question. So thank God you asked because um, I've been referring to FDM uh, throughout the presentation as if it was given. I apologize for that. So FDM and um, FDM is one of the most standard or the most easy to imagine 3D printers, I would say. Uh, they basically use, for example, oh, if you have a glue gun and you place that glue gun around and produce a layer and then put a layer on top of it and then another layer on top of it. So you basically are gluing layers on top of successive layers. So that's pretty much what FDM does. FDM basically uh, prints layer on top of layer on top of layer by putting on a molten plastic or other materials. Uh, when, in regards to our materials or our printers, we actually use a technology called stereolithography. We actually have our own technology called low force stereolithography, which is an advanced form of stereolithography. But let's just settle, talk about stereolithography first. So stereolithography 
is one of the liquid-based photopolymer, uh, photopolymer 3D printers. What it does is it has a pool of uh, resin that is reactive to light, and we use that light to harden the parts. So there are different many ways in how 3D printers sort of harden this photosensitive liquid resin, our uh, printers actually use make use of a laser. So what happens is there's going to be a liquid pool of pool of liquid photopolymer resin. There's going to be a laser, usually from the bottom. It cures one layer. So that's actually how you print one layer. The layer is lifted up and then you cure the next layer on top of it. The difference really comes down to the difference that I can see between FDMs and SLA printers are really, really in the quality of the print, uh, especially because each and every layer is sort of bonded chemically in SLA or liquid-based 3D printers. They're much, much smoother and an added advantage if you are into sort of engineering applications. You really need the part to be sturdy. With FDM 3D printing, for example, if I were to have 3D printed this uh, on an FDM, each layer will be sort of mechanically bonded, sort of like gluing each other, making it sort of weaker in one side and stronger in the other. Whereas in SLA or liquid-based 3D printers, each layer is chemically bonded the same way the entire layer is made, if that makes any sense. Meaning there's no directional difference in the strength. So that's the big difference between FDM and SLA. I agree that there are different pros and cons for FDM. For example, FDM is sometimes, sometimes could be easier to use, sometimes it could be cheaper to use, whereas SLA, it may be, it's going to be smoother and it's going to be stronger. And that's why for the Texas a and the wind tunnel application, a smoother and a harder part was more uh, suitable for this application. So I'm not going to say which one's better. It just uh, I'm just going to say that for this specific application, an SLA was better. Thank you for that question. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we have uh, two questions from Mr. Andrea Spiriti for uh, Italian Aerospace Network. Uh, he would like to know uh, the maximum size of uh, printed parts and any strategy for managing bigger parts in the future. Okay, so that is a really good question. Um, I would be curious to know what kind of sizes they are looking at. Um, at the end, I did mention that we do offer two different types of printers, the 43 and the 43 L. Uh, you can actually see it on my screen here. The 43 offers 14.5 times 14.5 uh, as the base, so it's a square base, and the height is 18.5 centimeters. The 43 L, which is five times the print volume, offers um, 33.5 times 20 and then 30 centimeters in height. So that's the maximum height of 3D printing with our 3D printers specifically. In regards to how we can, sorry, what's the other second part of the question, I believe was any strategies of managing bigger parts, yes. So as I mentioned uh, with the example with Optimus Ride, um, when they were having a project that was really a crunch of time and they didn't have a large format 3D printer, they resorted to printing parts, um, small parts and then combining them into bigger parts. Now, this will depend specifically on your application, whether this is suited or not. If it's a cosmetic part, it's not that much of an issue. If it's a, a mechanical part or, or a part that's supposed to withstand a load, I think it's it becomes more complicated. It becomes more challenging. You have to look into the specific ways parts are uh, bonded together. If you are going for cosmetic, just slice it Slice it and glue it together. You can use super glue, especially because our 3D printed parts are acrylic. You can use basic super glue and that wouldn't be a problem. However, if you are going for a non-cosmetic or aesthetic part, you're going for something that's sturdy. You need something that will withstand the load. Having a clear cut actually makes it easier to slide off and break easily or uh, come uh, break apart when you are applying the load. So if you are actually combining a part that needs to be strong, have Think about how it could be intercombined. It can make it a, 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 what do you call, a staggered connection, which is actually much better to ensure the correct fit. Or you can actually have um, supporting parts that, for example, a rod in between to actually support the entire mechanical stress. Hopefully that answered your question. And um... Also, another another question is: uh, uh, Can uh, you use uh, ceramics uh, material? Okay, okay, that's a wonderful question. I think that's somebody who is familiar with firm labs. Uh, ceramic resin is one of the materials that we used to offer, uh, not anymore, unfortunately. Um, it really does depend on the application. Um, if you are looking to prototype something that is 
supposed to look and feel like ceramic, a rigid 10K actually turned out to be quite ceramic-like. If you can actually hear, um, uh, these parts are actually quite rigid. They're quite sturdy and they actually feel a lot more like ceramic and they do have a powdery feel. To answer your question, no, we don't have a ceramic resin as of now. Maybe we'll, we'll, we will in the future. But currently, if you are are considering a ceramic-like material, which tank K will be the one. Uh, thank thank you. you. Thank you very much. And um, I would like to ask uh, some application, uh, for example, um, in design of uh, um, cities or buildings. Um, for example, having a 3D printer as a developer for um, uh, architectural project yeah. can be valuable for them just to picture how a project might be delivered. Or is there any application that, uh, from your experience, is being asked by um, design and architecture uh, studio from all over the world? So, yes, thanks. That's a really great question. Architecturing is actually one of our one of our bigger industries. I would say we do have a lot of customers in terms of workflow. It is quite straightforward. This is one example. Uh, this is an example of a house model. You can actually see the inside and you can actually see uh, the compartments and including the furniture as well. In terms of workflow, usually companies already have a digital uh, digital data of the of the either the landscape or the city or the house they're building. So it's quite easy to transfer from uh, data to 3D printing. As long as you have the 3D data, which is, I would say, the harder part, you can actually 3D print it. Has it, has it been done? Yes, absolutely. We actually have um, actually, we do have an application back in Japan where they're actually making dioramas for customers to actually visualize before investing in. So it's not that, it's, it's actually a very common usage, yes. So was there a different, I'm sorry, did I miss any of your questions? We are checking for the question so far, uh, no. Okay, great. No other question. Um, uh, Perhaps uh, uh, I would be curious to know, um, at the very beginning of your presentation, yes. we, can, we can see much better. <laughs> okay. At the very beginning of the presentation, uh, uh -huh. we show uh, some uh, part uh, that we uh, consider like prosthetics uh, for medical appliances. I was okay. curious, uh, let's say the raising that uh, FormLab can, can give, for example, are uh, able to be used uh, in uh, uh, as prosthetic in human bodies, or is still uh, like a prototype that must be cast in uh, I don't know titanium, something that uh, let's say is not affecting uh, uh, the health the human body. Of the patient. Yeah. Okay, uh, that is a really great question. So prosthetics, prosthetics are usually something that are used on the outside, if I'm not mistaken. But I think your question is regard to medical implants plants inside the body. Right. right. Okay, great. So the Biomed Clear or the Biomed uh, Biocompatible Resins that we offer are mucosal membranes. So they have been tested for cytotoxicity toxicity for the mucosal membrane. So they're not meant for anything inside the body. As in like literally where, wherever the blood goes, it's not meant for it. For mucosal membranes, like inside your mouth, it is still, it is suited. We are not at the stage of producing um, um, internal medical implants yet. Currently, we're thinking, not we're thinking, the applications is in surgical guides or um, say, what else? Long-term, uh, long-term. So the biocompatibility is limited to this inside your body. Okay. Okay. Okay, very, very well. And um, is there anything, uh, uh, anyone that would like to add or any inquiries? Or uh, Miss Nishino, if you'd like to add uh, something more, for example, I know that uh, a big part of the team of Forlem is based in Bangkok. So thank you again also for uh, adding the time to, to deliver a presentation. Would you like to add something else? Let's say, how can we uh, found form lab, uh, or let's say, uh, not only for uh, Bangkok, Thailand, but also in Asia, for example. 
Yes, absolutely. Thanks for that. Um, you can always reach out to, if you are in Thailand, you can always reach out to Septidin, who is our local reseller in Thailand. If you are not from um, Thailand, you can always reach out to apac.sales at fromlabs.com. You can actually see it on the bottom side of this bottom of the screen, uh, right hand side as soon as that thing goes away. Apac.sales at fromlabs.com is the way to reach way to reach us if you're not in Thailand. If you're in Thailand, please reach out to your local reseller, Septillion. And uh, thanks for the opportunity. I really had a great time presenting. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for your time. And uh, one more thing, would you be able to share the presentation or part of it after uh, the webinar uh, in case, or we just deliver the video okay, record on YouTube? Okay, uh, yes, I can provide the slides to you. Okay, very well. So let's say, uh, I think that's all. We don't have any other question popping up in the chat. So I would say thank you again for your time and thank, thank you. you for your participant connecting to us. Uh, we will share also, um, sorry, just now pop up a, a question, but- uh, yeah, I the, think it's our centillion, yeah. Uh, sorry, just to notice it from the team uh, in, in Thailand, I believe. But <laughs> yes, anyhow, thank, yes, you, thank you again. And for every participant, we will upload the record uh, uh, registration of this webinar online on YouTube uh, uh, channel and uh, Please connect to us uh, to KCC. Uh, we are based in Bangkok or either, either way to Septilion. Uh, thank you again for your time and have a great day. Thank you. Bye bye.